Um, are, are you feeling bitter? Or are you feeling bittern? Um, let's, let's get some bittern on. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna bring just sort of, uh, uh, hold on, I'm bringing in uh, my friend uh, Ray Bonto here. Um, uh, Ray Bonto, I'm gonna allow you to um, unmute yourself. Um, there we go. Um, so um, <laughs> you're, you're down with bitterns today? Yes, I went to Horniman yesterday and there was a museum and there was a bittern over there, specimen, so. Oh, so the, uh, these are cool critters. They're really cool critters because their, their camouflage is so solid that, um, they, so they've, they've, they're these sort of a, a, a brown bird with brown stripes on its chest. And when it gets a little bit spooked, it stands among the brown rushes and reeds and tulies and sticks its beak straight up. And when it does that, its eyes are still looking at you this way. And, but it's got these streaks on its tummy. So it just looks, it just blends in. But sometimes the bitterns will walk out of those tulies and they'll get scared and they'll stand there in the middle of the grass with their beak straight up going, you can't see me, you cannot see me. And they didn't get the memo that they are out of their camouflaged environment. So don't try this if you're not in the middle of a patch of tulies. But let's get some bittern on today. I think that that sounds like a fun project. So thank you, Ray Bonto, for that suggestion. Thank you. Absolutely. So here we go. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first, um, I'm going to bounce over to, I'm going to show you how I do a web search for um, interesting, um, interesting subjects. And then um, new window. And there I go. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna do just a, a little bit of, uh, of, of surfing around. We're gonna look at some photographs of bitterns. And then we're going to, uh, I'm gonna take you over to a couple of my favorite websites for bird images. And we'll take a look at things there. And then we will work at drawing these together. Um, and bittern's a, a, a good subject. That, that'll be, it'll bring up some interesting kind of drawing challenges and, and ideas. Um, so let me see, here is Zoom, here is share screen, and share. Um, there we go. Um, so, I am going to just type in, in this case, American bittern because um, I live here in the States. And I'm going to go to this. This is Google image search right here. So you can get to it this way, or you can just hit more images. And it's going to bring you over to Google image search. A good strategy that um, I'll do in this when you are looking for things in here, if you hit tools, I'll sometimes uh, bring that over to, I'll just sort of see large things because then I'll be able to zoom in on those more. And that is a, that's, that's a useful, um, that's a useful feature. Um, so here's the bittern in flight, black wingtips. Um, you see kind of hunched down here, kind of, it looks sort of a football shaped body, but then when it's um, elongated, it's this really long thing. So it is a total shape shifter. And because its feathers are a little bit thicker, you don't quite see the same kinks and angles that you get with a heron neck, but the same sort of bone structure and muscular structure is going on inside there. Um, and um, so they're, they're, they're really uh, elegant, interesting, interesting birds. You can see all the streaks on them. And when, when they are doing their head up thing, um, everybody, uh, they think that you can't see them. So yeah, this one um, didn't get the memo that it is not in. Um, <laughs> it's, this is what it does when it's hiding in the tulies. 
So look at that. So down the center of the neck, there's one major row of dark, one on the either side of that and some other ones. A little bit of a collar down here. Um, notice how when its head is up, it's still looking at you. You can see those eyes looking straight at you. Isn't that cool? So also when it's bringing, holding its head forward, it's looking, still looking down at the water where it's going to strike. Um, more pale throat with one streak going up the middle of it that is lined with dark. Speaking of that being lined with dark, um, let's take a look at those little kind of dark marks along the sides of the head of the bittern here. Um, so here we have a bittern, the view image. All right. So we have um, sort of dark going along the side of the head here. And then that leads into this little dark mark here on the side of the head of the bittern. So we notice where that is here in this view. And then we're gonna compare where that is um, on the head of the bittern when we, um, when we stretch out the neck. <clears throat> For the details of the head here, what's going on is, so this is this, this whole area here going in from this point here, there's no feathers in this. So that's just like an egret. There's no feathers in this. But in the bittern, there is this dark stripe that then connects into the upper, the top part of the upper bill. The line between the upper and lower bill is right down here. So it's not a dark upper bill, light lower bill. This upper bill is bicolored. So you've got a, a stripe of that here, a stripe of that here, and then the edge of that bill is also darker. Ooh, I mean, just such a cool looking bird. Notice how that eye is just angled forward a little bit right there. Hmm, I love this bird. Good choice, Ray Bonto. Let's take a look at the head of that bird when it is extended, right? So here is that dark line again going out here. Um, the lower, this line coming up here connects into this dark going up here right at the separation of the upper and the lower beak. And then that comes down here, starts off brown, then turns black. Notice this kind of hairdo thing that we're going, going on right here. Look at this, sort of, a, if, you're, you know, you'd, if you were to draw this, you'd sort of, there'd be a little kind of line here. There's a sort of cap of hair. There is this cheek here, again, of course, not hair. Birds don't have hair, those are feathers. Um, this is your auricular patch, your cheek patch in here. And then coming off the top is this big mane. Look at what that mane does when the bird tucks its head in. We'll go back to this one, view image again. <clears throat> so here what we're doing is we're just looking at the bird, and I'm just saying out loud all these things that I notice about it. I do the same thing when I'm looking at a bird in the field. When I look at a bird in the field, I say out loud all the details that I see about it. And then that helps me be able to translate that to paper. If you just look at it, you stare at the bird, what's going to happen is your brain will notice details, but it'll then forget them. If you just sort of say out loud, oh, isn't this interesting? Look at this little kind of hair piece. Look at like, you know, what that does. Oh, oh, that's really cool. Makes this arc around here. I wonder what that does when its head is extended, All right? <clears throat> um, so if you were to chunk this into different sections, I would have right up here, here is my, um, my bird head with that little hairdo piece. I've got my ear patch. This throat bump here has its own big section that is going to then tie into the lower belly here. So there's one section here, another section here. My wings, big mass there. You can see the um, dark primary feathers tucked in underneath here. Oh, that's such a cool looking bird. All right, so again, I start off just by looking at the bird. Oh man, this is freaking me out. Look at that dark 
this thing's got its throat all expanded. Oh, it must be vocalizing. These things do this cool. Um, wonderful vocalization. Um, and that one is doing its. This it makes this very strange sort of deep noise. Look at how with this throat all expanded, this is this really big bar. But then when we are not vocalizing and you don't have your throat all expanded, that business is going to come down to this. Whoa. That. So there's that little hairdo piece. There's that dark bar kind of now tucking even in underneath that. Wow, that's amazing. And what was neat about that, uh, that other picture we're looking at is that you could see that that little dark bar there, when the head was really tucked back, Um, when the head is tucked back, look at how that kind of cuts across the bottom of this. I would expect it to kind of line up this way, but it doesn't. It goes across that way. It's neat. Whenever you notice something that is different than what you would expect the bird to do, um, say that out loud. Um, let's listen to this because <laughs> the, the vocalization of this thing. Is that not the best thing? And it's this really deep, deep thing that you can, you, you more feel it than hear it. How would you describe that? Ever tried to unstop a toilet? <laughs> Oh, that, I mean, such a cool bird. All right, so let's draw it, right? Let's draw this thing in several different poses. Um, the, um, oh, by the way, uh, if you are um, using um, Google image searches, um, just remember a lot of the pictures that are on there are um, copyrighted and we wanna respect the copyright of those photographers. And so you can often get the permission of the photographer for your own drawing, your own personal drawing, you can do whatever you want with whatever you want. But if you're going to be selling that piece of artwork or putting it in a book, you definitely wanna get permission from that artist. If you're gonna be selling it in a craft fair, same thing, um, get permission of that photographer. Um, it's just sort of a, uh, it, it's a it's a courtesy, and it's also it's 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 their picture. You'd want somebody to do the same to you. Um, there is a there are two websites that I want to point out to people. Um, let's see. The first here is BirdPixel. BirdPixel.com. Um, and this is um, uh, Vivek Kanzode's um, incredible uh, bird portfolio, um, bird photography portfolio. So professional bird photographer who um, loves and supports nature journaling. And so, you know, you scroll down here, this is within these different categories. Let's see if we can find our bitterns going down here. Uh, bitterns, egrets, and herons. So I go into this and look at these. So within each of these little categories here, um, <clears throat> little bittern, uh, where is the American bittern? I'm going to get this one up. And um, 
Vivek has given all of us um, permission to use these extensively in our artwork. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, the, another uh, website that I want to put on people's um, radar is Seeing Birds. Um, the photos, photos of Ashok Kosla here. Um, and page not found. What do you mean page not found? I don't believe it for a minute. I'm going to get rid of this and try it again. There we go. There he is. Really, really sweet, wonderful uh, guy, Alaska explorer and um, uh, avid photographer, fully supporting what we're doing here. So now we're going to go down on this, bitterns and herons. Here they are. So these are organized by families. So these are in families. And um, so we'll take a look at these. Oh, so we've got a bunch of different poses here. Um, and so what we're going to do is we can use these to help us with our, our, our sketching here. We're gonna first start with this nice, static pose right here. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Oh, you are such a cool bird, right? So what we're all going to do is um, we're going to just start off with some gesture sketches. So I'm going to put up the bird and without worrying about the right way to do it, what we're going to do is fast, loose, quick sketches of these birds, right? And um, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between um, uh, Ashok and Vivek's websites. And um, so I'm going to run and grab my pad of paper. Meanwhile, everybody else, start quick gesture sketch of this bad boy. So the first few sketches of any day are going to be your brain just kind of warming up. And a bunch of them, and we talk about the idea of sacrificial pancakes in drawing. This is the time when your brain is just sort of warming up and making a connection with your hand and your pencil. And this, the, the, the pictures invariably will come out, you know, kind of weird um, at the start, especially. And it's okay. Um, we have to get through these in order to get to the next ones. Um, so let's try this. Oh, you've got yourself a bullfrog tadpole, don't you? Oh, yes, you do. Oh, zap. Oh, kazap. All right. Um, but we don't want to do you in flight. That is cool. Maybe we'll do some in flight. Oh, let's do that one. All right. So same birdie. These are, I mean, just look at that intricate camouflage on the back. This one, what a bold, bold dark stripe down the side of your throat. Wow. And it's going to be here for about 30 seconds more. Try this one. 
get this little post. Need to see that um, dark patch on the top of the head, huh? Oh, that's fun. <clears throat> I love that leg position, that kind of stance, like hut, 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 hut. Interesting that other ones seem to have a black spot on the top of the head here. I'm seeing brown. Interesting that kind of black spot right there at the nape. I wonder what's up with that. Haven't noticed that before. Notice that I am saying out loud anything that's a surprise to me. Like, is it a juvenile adult thing with the brown cap versus a black cap? Don't know. I don't know. Little sketch here. Gesture that in. I, I want to show folks just sort of what my kind of general approach to when I'm saying do these gesture sketches. I wanted to give everybody a little chance to warm up, but um, I, I'd, I'd like to um, I would like to uh, to show you how I would um, how I would approach doing that. Um, let's see, this is good and it's working. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a little split screen here, Melinda style. And I am going to show you how I would go about um, kind of handling some of these uh, gesture sketches for getting the, the oomph of this, this bird down. <clears throat> um, I think it is very valuable to make a bunch of sketches of a lot of different birds at the start, if you're going to be kind of working on a more finished portrait of something, rather than start with one photograph and zoom in on that just to give you a sense of the variation and the, the major zones of, of the plumage and how those fit together as the bird moves. Um, let's see here. I am going to do a new share of my desktop. So here is what I'm looking at. And are you all looking at a, a can you see both the bittern and the 
the paper here? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so I'm just going to do this all just with a graphite pencil. Um, and here we go. So um, for, for me, one of the most helpful lines is the one across the back of the bird. I do the same thing when I'm drawing a mammal. And so what I start doing is just sort of a general, like this thing's kind of hunched over. And then there's a more of a bump where the head is. And then there's a little kind of lump of a back, All right? Um, then I like to kind of put in just sort of a, you know, the ball of my head is somewhere in here. The throat is doing something like this. So I'm looking at this negative space here where the throat comes down and then out and in. The angle of my bill is up like this. So is the bill pointing up? People tend to draw the bill horizontal. But if that's not what I'm seeing, then that's not what I'm drawing. So that helps me sort of initially, that's how I might be kind of initially blocking this thing in. Then I'm thinking, all right, there's sort of a zone of the head in here that seems to be one thing. There's a, a throaty zone in here that's another thing. Um, there is a scoop of neck material all in this zone here. Necky, that's an official term. Or not. So that's, that's kind of a, a useful kind of initial blocky in on this bird here, but it started with that, what is the, the contour of that over the top here. Something I didn't do here is I didn't stop and check my proportions. Uh, always a good idea. I often make my head too big and I kind of made my head too big in here. Isn't that interesting? One way of handling that is you write head is smaller and draw that in. Another thing you could do is just sort of another little sketch off on the side. But I'll often not erase these gesture sketches. I'll just sort of, you know, leave them in there to uh, be. I'm not going to uh, drop over to. Let's see some of those others that we already saw. Um, yeah. So if I were drawing this one here, um, um, I'm going to start just with the negative shape on the left side of that neck. And it does something like that. Then I'm going to put in, all right, you've got a ball of a body right in here. You've got a head that is coming in somewhere in there. And then I look at the, again, the negative shape. On the right hand side, it comes out a little bit, it comes down straight, and then it's coming back in there. Another line that I, I love, I love, I love putting in the line that is the center line down the middle of the back. And on this one, it comes over to the left a little bit. So that helps me kind of get, you know, that there is this, there's this plane on the back of this bird like that, sort of a darker zone. And then it's rounding down in there. I might sort of initially frame this little bitter now. Oh, look up there. All right, so this, this is neat. Look at this negative shape. Whoa. Uh, that's that's too close. Um, here on the back, see this curve here, and then that. So I'm just so into now. There's a bunch of different ways of, by the way, of doing kind of the gesture sketch. 
some people just kind of get in there and they'll make sort of, you will just sort of do a scribble drawing from inside the core to out. So in their, 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 their drawing would might look something like their, their approach might just sort of be in the, you know, initially kind of I'm, I'm up in, in here and, and sort of feeling kind of head, head sort of feeling pointy up here. And, um, you know, so that it, the, the, there isn't really, you're just sort of putting your lines down and emphasizing those as you, um, as, as, you, as you make more lines, you're emphasizing some and then, you know, ignoring others. I still really love the approach of just starting with the negative shape. So I would just look at that negative shape that is along the back side of the neck. And so I get something like this. There's a little shelf, and then the bird's back comes down there. So it's a curve, a little curve in there. So I would get that shape down. And then I'm going to kind of flesh that out that this is. Um, the, there's a negative shape here that's, that's a bump here. So by negative shape, again, I'm looking at this shape here. I'm looking at this shape here, the air next to the bird. If I get in there with all those patterns and details, I'm gonna get lost in pattern and detail. So look at this little guy. Same thing for me. I would start with this as just there's there's a, there's sort of a head lump, and then there's a body lump. It's my line of the back, and it's about in an angle like that. And then I'm my head is has about this thickness. And I'm going to attach that onto the negative shape underneath the throat. So there's this little hook in here, and that kind of bowls in here. So I just get this negative shape, I get this negative shape, and then I'm going to use that for blocking in my little friend. On this one, I'm seeing there's a zone of these chest feathers that's coming through here, matching up in there. There is wing throughout this area. And then for the legs, negative shapes are also wonderful things. Um, so if you draw in one leg and then draw in another leg, they're often too close to each other or too far apart. Um, if I instead look at the negative shape between those legs, I've got a little kind of a, a, a loop that is doing something like that. So I can put that in first and then have that direct me to create those two legs supporting that barren body up there. If I want to flesh this out a little bit more with um, um, some patterns, with my pencil, I'm going to just lightly show some contours around here. See, I'm kind of drawing this as this rounded thing here. This line pointing, curving this way. This line here curving this way. What I'm doing is I'm imagining, say, an orange with an, uh, a little line straight through the middle of it curving this way on either side of that. See that? So right here is my stripe coming right down the middle. These ones here are curving in this direction on that side of it. They're curving in this direction on that side of it. And that makes this whole business here feel rounded. So if I draw those lines in, then um, I can say that uh, you have, uh, 
you know, a line in here. And these lines here are going to want to curve that way. These lines here on the other side are curving in this direction. The pencil I'm using here has a very dark lead um, and it is, and I kind of keep it with a blunt point and that allows me to, to, to make, you know, kind of cover a lot of territory really, really quickly. We're putting in those patterns. So as you're sculpting this thing, just remember that this is a rounded object, a rounded object. So that means patterns in it are going to be wrapping, any pattern on that is wrapping around that. Maybe this one gets an ear patch. <clears throat> this one does want to be a little bit more chesty. Let's take a look at some bird pixel. Um, I wonder if they were out together on the same uh, bird watching expedition. There's the same dinner. Huh. Um, here, oh, that's cool. Look at this pose. I mean, how different is that? Oh, that's so cool. So look at this negative shape around the start. So I would just start with that arch. I would start with that arch, then tuck this negative shape under it. And that's going to give me that basic bird shape there. All right, so um, I'm going to start with a, a bird arch. And there's a head that's in here somewhere. And there's a throat. It's going to come over and then bump out. So there's this tummy section in here. We have on the body here, there's an upper part here. This is scapular feathers, right? That are all up in here. And then the wing is dropping down next to that. And then that is on a leg that is coming down in here. And then there's another leg that is rocked back in there. This head, oh, that's so cool. Um, how do I get you to, oh, there we are. Let's just mess with this head a little bit, okay? Um, What a cool looking bird. So I've got an overall head thing going on like this. And there is a, a beak that is coming out. And I want to add, let's make that actually down at more of an angle. The start of a drawing, it's easy to change the directions of, of lines of, of elements. We're talking about a 
weakness that is coming in here. Now look at how that comes back to where the eye is. So the eye is in line with the upper mandible or the, the upper the upper bill here. And then the lower bill, the feathers scoot in. And come out. There's then a set of white feathers that tucks up underneath the bill and is going to come down. From this point in here, the forehead comes up like a ramp. Feathers around the eye. There's something kind of coming up here. So there's a there's a nice kind of dark cap. It's right in there. And from the back of the bill here, we have an ear patch. It's cutting down in there. The black patch is making a strange dark square on the side of the head here. And then the feathers here of the head are fanned out. So kind of in this area, in this area, up here on the back. You got that back coming down. My eye. I'm putting it in. Uh, no, I made mine more of a vertical oval. This wants to be more of a horizontal oval. And it is pointed on the top corner. And in here is some dark. So go a little bit more slowly right around the eye. If your eye is kind of crisp, everybody's going to think you have this incredibly detailed drawing. Right? Everybody's going to look at your eye first. Fairly large pupil, let in a lot of light there. And then the dark, what are we doing? <clears throat> Let's first put in this little yellow area. Right? So there's yellow that is going to go over the eye. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of bright area there. On the underside, we're going to come in here. And there is a dark zone that comes up into the top of the bill. Its nostril, you can see here. Running along like that. So a little horizontal line of the nostril. And that is built into the dark on the top. I wonder if I know in feathers, dark means that you've got more melanin and it's a strengthening agent. I wonder if there's a reason to have, is that a strengthening agent in this? Is it just for more pattern? I don't know. But I'm curious. This little bit here comes up. And when it hits the bill, there's a dark wedge on the bill coming up like that.
the throat here, there's a little bit of kind of hint of some dark feathers coming up on the bottom of that. And then you see those coming up fairly far. I really like this slaty, um, there's a little bit of dark, really dark right above this patch here. And we're gonna come up and then in. I want this little piece here by the eye to step step out. I want I like this this little kind of wedge of light in there. Maybe it comes down further here. Yeah, that's kind of a gives it that angry birds look, right? As does this little dark above that. I'm just going to uh, crisp up a few of the little edges here, add some dark accent right in here. There is dark on the front of the chest. thin white this time. So when I was drawing this stripe here, I was drawing the dark stripe. Now I'm drawing the white stripe. So your brain, don't get into the habit of I'm going to draw this stripe and then this stripe and then this stripe. Draw the dark stripe and then draw the other side of the white stripe. And that will help all your elements get. And then I have another dark stripe here. So now my brain is shifting. My dark stripe is what I'm drawing. And then this bird is going to get a little bit of color because I'm only two minutes over time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And uh, fairly soon, I'm going to be doing a, uh, in a few weeks, uh, some workshops on playing with gouache. And if you hate spoilers um, and don't pay attention to this next part, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be emphasizing using light value gouache um uh paint on um on light things and for the dark parts i'm actually just going to be using straight up watercolor um so spoiler alert let's just drop a little bit of this color in on the bird i'm going to try to keep my colors here simple And because I put in all of that, um, all of those pencil lines, that actually handles a lot of the shading for me. So what I can do now is just, I'm gonna pick up some red brown and like, ooh, these are red brown stripes. There's this cool Payne's gray, cap that it has, that steel 
gray cap. that towards the back end fades into brown. I'm gonna put a little bit more blue into it. And that same color is then going to come down onto the beak. And this part in here is brown. There is a little brown part in here. And there's some cool Haynes blue gray in here. Now, the part I've been really excited about is these whites and these yellows. They're gonna be fun to do. So here I get my little gouache palette out and I'm gonna get some white and I'm gonna mix that with some yellow, little crazy things. And a little bit of this little tan in there. And on the toned paper, this stuff just sings. It's so much fun to put this stuff on. Um, and so you're gonna want to overdo it. And this bird has an iris that's yellow. And it shades more into a little bit of brown on the underside. There's this deep, inky pupil. I have to be careful about putting that in because this wants to kind of get out and get away. And lastly, it's it is, it's so much fun to put gouache on tone paper. I'm also going to take a little bit of white on my brush right now. I'm going to just give this a little bit of reflected light right here along the, the top of its bill and hit that with my finger. So I put some down and I kind of can fade it out with my finger. Don't want it to be too strong, but in there. Put a little bit of a highlight in here in the eye. Uh, 
And it's coming back with a one last little bit of wash in here, a little bit in here. A little bit just pop in here. Oh, that was fun. That was fun to do. And then I'm going to stop. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to just try to put in a few little dark accents. I should stop right now. That would be smart. Um, I'm going to fan the tip of this brush so that it just makes more kind of line marks. I've got some dark on that. And I'm going to just kind of flick up this way a few places to crisp up that edge, crisp up or give myself a little bit of texture in here in some of this part coming into here. And now I'd better stop. Watch me not take my own advice. A little bit of a reflection light across the forehead. There you go. Um, so that, my friend Ray Bonto, is a little bit of fun with a bitter. And I hope that this was uh, an enjoyable way to kind of break down these shapes, think about, you know, kind of how to capture some of those forms. And then uh, we got a little bit of, of, of a look at what I did with the gouache here. Notice that with the gouache, I only use light values with the gouache. All my darks are watercolor. Spoil alert for the series uh, coming up on using gouache um, in your nature journal. So um, there is no one way to draw. There's not a right way to do it. The way that I approached it is not the only way to do it, but it, um, you are able just to sort of see some of the, some of the approaches and strategies that I, that I use here. Um, what I'm gonna do now is we're going to open this up to questions specifically about what we're doing here. Um, and if people also want to share uh, bitterns that you've been drawn, um, please do. If you've got any notebooks with like previous bitterns from the field, uh, we'd love to see those. And um, uh, just remember when you're out in the field and you're, you look around, you don't see anybody. You are in bittern territory. And that's a lot of fun. Great reason to head on down to the marsh today. Um, so we, we can't hear what you're saying right now, um, but we can see what you've been up to. So we've got the tone paper here. Is that um, so a pale colored pencil on it? Yeah. So um, pale, a, a, a white prisma colored pencil is another great tool for having with toned paper. Um, and you're able to really pop those things out. Um, I like the eye of that one where you've got the, the head, the dark spot on it. It kind of has, it's got bitter and intensity. Um, and, you know, look at how, you know, the, 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 the bitterns look serious. Like, you know, they're, they're just kind of like, ah, and this, this has that bitter look. So it's, it's looking back at you. And I think part of what it is, is you've made that line, see how her, um, 
Heidi's line towards the top and front of that eye is stronger than the line on the lower side and the back side of the eye. Because she did that, that eye kind of looks more intense. If Heidi had put a line all around the eye of a consistent weight, it would just look like a circle. But because you've got that line variation, um, your eye looks much more kind of, you know, bitter and en energy, just like, uh, I'm looking at you. So unfortunately, we still can't hear you. We, we, uh, you are you are you are muted. But that's that 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 bitter and beak is 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 and and eyes. That's that's really kind of a great look. Thank you. Hey there. Are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, there we go. Hi. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, again, this is looking, it's, it looks kind of, it's got that bittern intensity. And I like the way that the head is sort of squat and tucked into the body. It's an, uh, and that um, also notice, um, there's kind of a cool thing going on here that you are using this um, sort of almost a, a, a purple blue colored pencil for blocking in some of them, and then using that with the warm red brown pencil. And that allows us to get many more of these images overlapped with each other, and it still reads. Look at how, so that's an, a, an idea that a lot of us can, oh, and that little one with the sprawled stance over on the far page. <laughs> I love that, that veteran. Um, but this idea that Debbie's got here of uh, mixing these gesture sketches with two different pencils, what a great idea. What a great idea. The first one is the fast and loose, and then the brown is when you were when you went back to each pose. So that I can tell the difference between the two ways of drawing. That I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey there. Hi, how are you? We're doing really well. Oh, wow. So you were um, doing your sketching. Is that with a, a, a brush pen or watercolor? Uh, yeah, so I did it with a gel pen and then a brush. Um, uh, uh, what it, water brush. That, those work really, really well together. Um, yeah, I've been trying to do quick sketches. So um, I think that medium works best for me. Mm -hmm. um, and notice how Gabriella has the area around the eye, there are some parts of that sketch that are handled lightly and loosely, but she's been really precise and careful right around the eye. And notice how that makes the entire drawing feel very, very precise. Um, Robert Bateman does the same thing. Um, right around the eyes, um, you know, just you're going to slow down and kind of get and be just a little bit extra patient right in there. And then that gives you this sense of, um, of, of, of detail. And that's very much the way we see. Um, as we look around in our field of view, the, fo the stuff, um, there's a small area that is in hyper-focus about the size of a postage stamp held at arm's length. That is how much of your field of view you actually see in hyper detail. And the rest of what you see, your brain is just trying to remember detail that was in there. And it gives us this illusion of having this. So having this sort of zone of focus, um, I think is a, a great strategy for a drawing. This is fun. And that one with the, the back, with the back of its head turned to us, Look at the, the feathers fluffing out on the edges. It would be really tempting to draw those feathers on the side of that as one big solid line, but those, those feathered lines going out there really kind of give you a sense of the texture. And also notice the very careful attention to the shape of the cap carves the head on that one that is turned away from us. The shape of that cap really carves the head. Gabrielle, that's terrific to see. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Ruth and family here. Oh, 
Let's check this out. Oh, is this from your garden? Um, this was from our backyard. Oh, tell us about the adventure and what you discovered going out there with your journal. Um, well, in school we had learned like, well, they're talking about like the stigma and the anther. So then I went outside and I drew this, but then I also wanted to do the flower. And so it's a common hibiscus. Oh, those are stunning flowers. And that little close up there, what a useful strategy to show those details. Because it is, there's so much, you can see more than you can draw, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you've drawn a little close up there inside that circle, which gives us the detail of um, that part of the flower. I also noticed that we've got, you're looking down the throat of it, you've got the side view, you're also um, in other places making notes about the shapes of the leaves. These are really useful nature journaling strategies. Oh, and check out the map. You've got a map where you're finding these things near the house. That mm -hmm. gives even a bigger context. So I really like the way that your brain is zooming in. Like a lot of us get kind of locked into one view, one angle. And, but you have got this with, um, you can zoom, your brain can zoom out and go diagrammatic. You can zoom in and show all the details. You can kind of go to the mid size and show the form. But more than that, you're showing me different views of the same thing. Those are, we're seeing so many cool nature journaling strategies that you're coming up with. Thank you. Thank you for showing that. What was the question that you came up with about the hibiscus? Um, there are ants crawling around in the flowers. I wonder why. Mm, great, so you're making an observation and you're wondering what is going on with that. That's terrific. That, that's the way we roll. I really like the way you are approaching your nature journal. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing that with us today. That was cool. That was really cool. Let's see what else is going on in our journals. Um, uh, Reagan, we've got a trout it looks like here. Um, let's take a look at that trout. Oh. There's Uncle I kiss my kiss. Yeah, so about this, we were going to like a fishing restaurant and they had a bunch of stuffed fish on the wall. And my brother knew like 10 of them. And I asked him what this one was and I thought it looked cool. So I tried to go home and draw it. So oh, that's I, I only made this one using colored pencils, but I think it looks pretty nice. The only thing I don't like is the head. I don't think I made it narrow enough. Should have been longer, but. Mm. Well, the, the good news is there actually is, just as in human beings, there's a lot of individual variation in the head shape. So if it doesn't look exactly like the one that was on the wall, you still have lots of wiggle room. <laughs> um, because uh, just as, you know, in, in, if you had a diagram that showed the shape of a human nose, um, you know, it, you could, there's a lot of wiggle room with it. Something that I think is really well observed here is the placement of all the different fins on the body. That's really cool. Um, and also you can tell that this fish was not a fish from a hatchery. Um, when fish are released from a hatchery, they usually snip off the adipose fin, which if you look along the back, you have the dorsal fin, and then you continue, continue down, there's that other smaller little fin there. Yeah. Usually that one is snipped off in hatchery fish. So this was a, uh, a fish that grew in the wild. That's really cool. Um, did you put the spots in last? Um. No, well, what I did is I put in the spots and then I did not think it looked realistic enough. So I touched up the fins and added the scales with the white gel pen. Oh yeah, that white gel pen really adds a sparkle to it, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Uh, but but first you put in the color of the body and then the spots over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, that's a very good order of operations. So if uh, Reagan had put in the spots first and then put the body color over those spots, the body color would have smudged and smeared those crisp little spots. So the order yeah. to do something really helps you be able to get these kind of crisp little patterns on this. Some people will say like, you know, how do you get that, that effect? I, mine keeps smearing and smudging. Um, just remember order of operations, those details, those spots, they come in at the end, maybe right before the gel pen. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you. Let's see what is um, also going on in our journals. Uh, Ray Bonto, you've been drawing bitterns up here. Let's check out your, uh, Ray Bonto's bitterns. Hey there. So, let's just um, um, very oh, I, well observed shapes here. I could draw them in detail, so why not? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but these 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 really have the chunkiness. These really have the feeling of the bitter. That one on the um, left page there, um, or I guess as we're looking at it, our right page, um, was that drawn directly with the no, other side, other side, other page? Was that one drawn directly with the brush? Yes, um, this brush. Oh, check you out. That's really cool. That's really neat. So. Um, branching out with different media, um, sometimes drawing directly with your brush. That's really neat to see. I like the way you are pushing yourself and challenging yourself. Any cool additions to your nature journal notebook these days? Certainly. Love to so see. I, I went out and I saw these flowers. Hold that closer to the screen for us so we can kind of zoom in on that. Oh, yeah. Um, they, these, they really have volume and form the, the, the colors, the, 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 the bright uh, magentas in those are really coming through. I like that kind of backlit effect you have with those, uh, that clump of um, disc flowers in the middle. Um, on that are sort of mounted on the little cone there. That backlit one um, is very, um, reminds me of Picasso's haystacks. That's fun to see. This is, this is great. The, and isn't it fun to get that bright gouache on the tone maybe there? Uh, yeah, it is. Oh, this is fun. This is really fun to see. What else has been going on? Uh, so I went to Hornemann Museum. So this was a dragonfly and this was part of an ostrich. <laughs> yeah, ostriches are, it, it's hard to get more than that on our page. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it was like that big. Yeah, that's fun. That's really fun. And it's neat to see the patterns on the dragonfly. Was that one that you were able to get really close to and look at a sort of magnified view? Uh, yeah, it was a model, like at six times. OK, great. So this was a hedgehog or porcupine. Yeah. Looks like one of those African porcupines with the with the zebra stripes in the uh, in the. Did it have sort of zebra stripe quails? Um, on the tail. On the tail. Yeah, it did. Yes, it did. Um, that's that, that African porcupine with ridiculously long spines, right? Huge. Um, yes. Yeah. Our North American porcupine has spines that are maybe. 
um, a couple of inches long at best. Um, but the, that African porcupine, just those spines are just amazing. This is a crab and this was some sort of bug. This was a good day. Which museum were you visiting? Ornament. Oh, oh, that's really fun. Uh, was this drawn again directly with your brush? Uh, no, zebra pen. That's the zebra pen, okay. Great, it's cool that uh, the one pincher is big, the other small. Oh, they've got a dodo? Oh, <laughs> you're gonna make me wait for my dodo. Oh, good time with the owls here. That was an eagle, uh, which was my favorite, and it was a, and this was a wood owl. Some yeah, okay. sort of wood. The, the eagle owl, right? Yeah, that one. Yeah, the eagle owl. I mean, that's such a huge, huge owl. Wings um, kind of like that. Yeah, that's a lot of owl. Can you imagine that thing coming down at you? That would be the just a bad day for uh uh, for a little critter. Um, I like your, um, the, this, you've, you've sort of simplified the facial expressions to a few key lines and the ones that you're choosing really still give you the expression of these owls. And then, oh man, I'm so sorry this bird went extinct. Yes. Ah. Uh, that is, that's really cool. Something that always bothers me about the dodo is that because it went extinct, it's kind of this metaphor for being maladapted, but it was perfectly well adapted for a, a long, long time. Just the, um, like in the, um, there's a, a, an animated movie, Ice Age, in which a dodo bird appears and it is just, it's running around, it's just an absolutely stupid bird. And, you know, it was, it was a completely successful, great strategy um, until you introduce human super predators on your island. And we wipe the thing out in a matter of moments as we just sort of tend to do everywhere we go. Um, but, you know, it's it's neat to, to you know, hear, just sort of give some respect to this bird and show that form. I like this a lot. And this is the green turtle. It was a little smaller than me, uh, but I heard in a book that it weighed at least sixty-five kg. I couldn't believe it. Ah, that's cool. Um, and also, let's go back to that uh, 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 sea turtle page there. That. I like the way you're handling those um, scutes on the shell there, showing those ones kind of going back in the middle. Um, out of our line of sight, we have those receding. Um, and notice that Ray Banto has not drawn them symmetrical on each side. Of course, they are symmetrical, but when you're looking at it at this angle, you're just sort of seeing that line up the middle and you're not seeing the other side of this. So this is a, it makes it for a real visualization challenge. Um, and you did a good job of sort of showing those, those, those angles and how it would appear from this view. I like that. Okay. Yeah, I, I did a ton. So here is the coconut crab. Whoa, does it eat coconuts? Uh, yes, it's one of the only vegan crabs. <laughs> 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 I love that. That's a good way to put it. Um, and again, uh, great use of the gouache here. Little horseshoe crab there too. This was a good day at the museum. Oscar, What's the not gouache. Oh, fun. Bittern. Ah. <laughs> And here's a porcupine fish. And you know, this was some strange 
lobster that I found. Hold hold on, stick with this for a moment. Just so many people would just be afraid of diving in and messing with this. And something that I really respect about your approach is you're going to like, you see it, you want to learn more about it, and you're just going to jump in there and, and begin. And a lot of people would psych themselves out and just go like, oh, too many parts, too complicated, too complicated. Um, but, uh, you know, all those little sections, like look at the, the, the way you've simplified those shapes, like on the antenna there. Um, oh, this is, this is really fun to see. This is, this is exciting. Be brave, everybody. Oh, look at these ones. What a successful museum visit. You got so much out of your time there. Uh, yeah, quite a lot. Today I went to a place called Epsom, just out of London, a little south, wow. not very far. So uh, there were ducks around when we went to a pond and mm -hmm. here was the park. And yeah. when I came back home, I was climbing up the, so we have a block and our house sits right on the top of it. And we were climbing up, up the stairs to get there. And I saw this spider. Oh, look at the cephalothorax with those white stripes up on the side of it. I like that side view of it too, showing how the abdomen sticks up above the level of the cephalothorax. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, the web was huge and it had other spiders in it, but this was the biggest and most active. Um, sometimes um, what you'll get is there will be male spiders hanging out in the web of a large female spiders with those males hoping to have an opportunity to mate with her. Um, if you get a chance to go back and check out the um, that spider, is it, you think it's still there? Uh, yeah, it lives in the web uh, and it's just downstairs. So um, what I would do is I would go back back and I check out those those little spiders and see if all right here is here is my my my, my cephalothorax. Uh, that, that little front part and the abdomen sits behind it. Um, so spiders have these things sticking out from their face called pedipalps. So not the chelicery, not the fangs, um, but these pedipalps are these little arm-like structures that stick out in front of the face. And what you want to do is use your, um, your uh, hand lens or magnifying glass or close focus binoculars and take a look at the shape of those pedipalps because if the small ones in the web are males, the pedipalps will have these big ends on them. So they will look like little boxing gloves. And um, that's, uh, those are part of the, the reproductive structures of the, of the males. And so yeah, check out the pedipalps and see if they have these, um, these sort of these, these swollen little balls on the ends of the, uh, on the ends of those pedipalps. And if so, you have a male. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ray Bonto. Really good. Oh, to see. I also had a question. Yes. Um, your large heavy tripod. My large heavy tripod. What type is it? Uh, the one you used to use for your Kawasco. Yes. Um, hold on. I'm, I'm in the closet right now. It is a. Um, there is a number on it. It is 701 Henry David Victor. So 701 Henry David Victor. I think it may be a Monrovia scope. Um, I'll show you the logo on it. Oh, Monfroto. Monfroto. I think that's the name of the scope company. Um, 
but what it, the uh, the logo is this little thing here. So somebody who knows scopes better than me, um, it's got that little symbol. That's their the little brand symbol. Um, oh no, here it is. Yeah, Man Manfrotto, M A N F R O T T O, and this scope is their seven zero one um, HDV Henry David Victor. That that's the scope that it has. It does a good job of keeping a heavy scope from uh, wobbling all around. Uh, could you switch from your document camera back to the main one so oh, sure. that I can see it properly? Ah, hold on a second. Um, we're going to go to this view. Hold on a sec. So I, another thing that's nice about this for um, for sketching, um, um, is that when I'm sketching or, or trying to get the thing in the scope, this um, handle is useful to move the scope around. But then it's kind of in your way as you're trying to 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 have your your sketchbook here. It's, it's right where you want to be sketching. So something that's kind of cool about this is that this handle can then get out of your way. And then you've got your hands down here sketching once you're on the critter. But then when I'm finding critters in the scope, I'll swing that back up and then move that around with that. Mm, nice. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Uh, and Jack, uh, um, I was sky watching a few days ago when there was not much light pollution. I didn't nature journal it. What, what but I, any of the Perseids? Yeah, no, 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 nothing special. Nothing special. Just, I saw Jupiter's moons. Oh, did you, but you didn't put them in your sketchbook. You know, they, um, every night, you can, uh, even from the city here in San Mateo with street lights out in front of my house, I can put my scope on Jupiter and I can get its moons. And then you can, in your sketchbook, you can just make a, 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 a little chart where you have Jupiter going Jupiter, 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 Jupiter. And then on um, night number one, draw the locations of the moon. The next night, draw the locations of the moon. The next night, draw the locations of the moon. Galileo did that. And then realized that you could connect certain moons by little sine waves and figured out which ones were that they were orbiting and which ones were the closest. It was able to figure that out back in the day. Bam. That's that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, Jupiter is, is a fun thing to, to do. Um, to, but and, and so what you want is just get a sort of a vertical line so your Jupiter's all line up and then just as carefully as you can plot the relative distances of the moon on night number one, two, three, four, right? And then, then try to connect those because if, if something is going around it, right? From your view, it's going to be your edge on on the plane of those moons. So you're gonna see that moon going back and forth like this. So one that is over time, so if, if I'm doing this over time, then what is happening is it's making a sine wave like that. And one that is closer will be going like this. And one that is uh, in a wider orbit will be doing this. Mm. Is, it's cool. It's, it's cool. Um, and so, yeah. So that's that that might be something you can even if you're in the city, you don't need a dark sky to get on those moons. You could see three of the moons. Three. Uh, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. Oh. Fun. Yeah, the um yeah, the 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 Jovian moons, the close Jovian moons get um named after 
um, you know, uh, maidens of mythology who had the um, fortunate or unfortunate um, uh, in, encounter with with Zeus, <laughs> um, and the um, so like you know Io is another one. Things did not end up well for Io. You see, the problem with Zeus is Hera, right? Yeah, that's that just. <laughs> Whew. Um, you don't want the wrath of Hera, um, because then you and your offspring will be kind of having tough times. I mean, you get to be cool like Hercules, right? Right, but <laughs> throughout your entire life, you're going to have like tribulations thrown in your way. But <clears throat> that's a whole other story. But 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 this, yeah. So so the the ones the, so check out the, the names of them. It's fun to then find the mythological story behind the the name of the moon. What was, what was Calista's yeah. Io's story was? I also saw Saturn and and it was all just through a 50 millimeter spotting scope at just 45 times. Yeah. Isn't it neat that we can see the rings on Saturn and the moons on Jupiter through our little spotting scopes? When I try to do it through binoculars, my hands are too sort of shaky, but you set up the scope and then you kind of go, you try not to touch it so it doesn't do more, right? And then, yeah, we're going to have a, there will be a nature journaling workshop. Um, I haven't put it on the calendar yet, but it will be um, all about um, kind of, um, you know, uh, low power astronomy and kind of having fun with uh, the, 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 the sky, maybe through a spotting scope or just things that you can do looking at it. There also is going to be an un upcoming workshop that we're going to have specifically about the moon. And um, for that, I want to encourage um, nature journalers um, from all latitudes. So especially if you are at an extreme latitude, ideally one that is not the same latitude as, it's okay if you're on the, my latitude here, but the more different latitudes we get, the more interesting this is going to be. Right, so we're, we're talking Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. We want equator. We want, um, so uh, Margarita, if you're watching, uh, we want <laughs> you um, on the, the uh, um, uh, uh, on that uh, sort of for central latitudes. And then we, uh, the more, uh, you, the closer you are to the poles, we're gonna get some really extreme thing. So just like on the solstice, this is, we're gonna have a, um, we're gonna have one night where everybody's gonna record the rising moon. And um, I need you there, Margarita, for this, All right? Yeah, when's your astronomy educators forum? Um, so that, that's, that's not yet, um, but well, I will get that on the charts. We'll get that Jack, I, Jack, I thought of mentioning um, there's a guy who writes for the BBC Sky at Night. Uh, he uh, specializes in na naked astronomy without any kind of um, binoculars or telescopes or anything. Um, I was thinking if I should have a chat and we can um, have a session for him in future sessions somewhere, if he agrees though. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I would love that. I would love that. Would you be able to maybe reach out and see if- I will, I will reach out, but I just thought of asking you if that's possible, then I'll, I'll talk to him. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, everybody out there, can I get a hallelujah? Right? Oh, yeah. We're all about that. That would be so cool. That would right. be- so I'll try talking to him. He writes for the BBC Sky at night, but he lives in the US though. Okay. Yep. Great. All right. I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great idea. Hey, anybody else that's got a really good idea, we want to know. We want Thank to. Thank you. Uh, that was cool. All right. Let me um, jump back to do, 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 gallery. And does anybody else have something cool that you want to share? So, I am uh, just 
in just a moment, um, I am going to be uh, turning off the recording. I want to thank everybody for being here. I'd like to send a shout out to my friend Ray Bonto for the inspiration of playing with bitterns today. That was really cool. Um, and I'd like to also thank everybody who shared their pages. Um, also, um, thank you so much, Ivea, for helping um, monitor and manage our, our uh, behind the scenes here um, at this. And um, it's wonderful to know that you've always got my back on these. Um, also, again, thanks to Ann Chadwick and Point Blue for the conservation work that they do and the work that they're doing with us on our infographic. So now I am going to be um, turning off the recording. Um, until we meet again, everybody, be safe, be kind, let's play in nature, don't worry about product. Let your journal be a tool to help guide you into a deeper connection and communion with the natural world. You can do this, and uh, we will see you again here soon.